I'd like to call this meeting of the Peoria Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. Glad to have you here. We're going to begin with a roll call now. Vice Chairman Jay Atluski. Present. Secretary Brian Patterson. Absent. Commissioner Sean Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Linda Grace. Present. Commissioner Clay Alsop. Present. Commissioner Tony Fighter. Present. And Chair Jeff Nelson is present. I'd like to begin with an opening statement that we begin all meetings with. This commission is composed of Peoria citizens who have been appointed by City Council to serve on the commission as a civic responsibility without compensation. Our duty is to study and review planning and zoning issues within the City of Peoria. The commission hears zoning cases, holds public hearings, or may conduct a study session on a topic. Decisions made by the commission are forwarded as written recommendations to the City Council who take the final action. All hearings are conducted in accordance with the Rules for Procedures and Robert's Rules of Order. Each case will be called in the order in which it appears on the agenda unless otherwise announced during the meeting. In the interest of maintaining a fair and efficient hearing, the Commission adheres to the following steps. Chair will open the case. City staff will then provide a brief report and recommendation. The applicant is then invited to give a presentation. Then any member of the public may provide testimony. Public testimony is limited to three minutes. When we call your name, please come up to the podium and provide your name and address. After all the testimony has been taken, we'll invite the applicant back up to provide any rebuttal or final statements. The Commission will then discuss the case and make its decision. Anyone wishing to speak must complete a speaker's request form and hand it to the Commission assistant on my left. Please be uh, as brief as possible and do not repeat statements already made by others. Any member of the public may appeal to the City Council the decision of the Commission regarding a conditional use permit. The appeal must be submitted in writing to the Planning and Community Development Department within 15 calendar days of the date of the Commission's decision. All Commission recommendations on public hearing items including general plan amendments, rezones, zoning code amendments, and special plans move forward to a regular City Council meeting. The City Council will then act on the recommendation of the Commission. The City Council may concur with the decision, modify it, overturn it, or remand it back to the Commission for further consideration. We welcome citizens' comments, and as fellow citizens of Peoria, we thank you in advance for your participation. This is the final call to submit those speaker request forms that I mentioned earlier. If anyone wishes to speak tonight, please fill out a form and provide it to Ms. Ernest at the end of the dais. And we're going to kick off the agenda tonight with our consent agenda. We have one item on the consent agenda tonight. Uh, discussion and possible action to approve the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting held on January 16th, 2020. Do any commissioners have any questions or comments about any of the consent agenda items before us tonight? All right. May I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the minutes as presented to us. Thank you. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Fighter. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Commissioners, please vote. Thank you. That passes unanimously. We're now going to move on to our regular agenda and new business. We have four items before us tonight, but only one will require action from us. The remaining three are study session items and are for discussion only. So let's begin with the action item, item 2R. Banfield Animal Hospital, conditional use permit CU19-13. This is a request for a conditional use permit to allow a veterinarian, veterinary clinic located at 24640 North Lake Pleasant Parkway, Suite 105. Uh, staff, uh, would you please present your report on this tonight? Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Matthew Gunderson, uh, planner with the city. I'm relatively new to the city, so this will be my first time presenting to this commission. Um, case number CU19-13 is for a conditional use permit to allow for a veterinary clinic um, in an existing vacant suite. <clears throat> the applicant is Scott Edwards Architecture on behalf of Banfield Animal Hospital. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is located at 24640 North Lake Pleasant Parkway, and it's in Suite 105, uh, the vicinity map up there, you, the little red box on the very bottom of the map. Um, shows the, the subject suite. Uh, the suite is approximately 5,132 square feet, um, and the applicant is seeking to obtain a conditional use permit to allow for a veterinary clinic uh, in a vacant suite in the Lake Pleasant Pavilion mm -hmm. Shopping Center. 
the Lake Pleasant Pavilions Shopping Center is located on the southwest corner of Lake Pleasant Parkway and Happy Valley Parkway. Uh, that is the center that is anchored by Target. Um, and then surrounding the property, uh, to the north you have Lake Pleasant Town Center. To the immediate west of the shopping center is the city boundary. So you have Maricopa County single family residences. To the south is a 230 foot power line corridor, followed by the Melton Ranch single family subdivision. And to the east is the Mountainside Crossing Shopping Center. Uh, the Lake Pleasant Pavilion Shopping Center is zoned as a PAD, um, and it refers to the Intermediate Commercial or C2 Zoning District with respect to permitted uses. As a result, veterinary offices and clinics are conditionally permitted at this location. Uh, what we're looking at on this slide is a conceptual floor plan for the suite. Um, it can be a little hard to read on the screen, um, but it is included as Exhibit 5 in your staff report. <clears throat> Uh, section 21-505 of the zoning ordinance addresses additional limitations that are placed on different land uses and subsection J.3 provides the limitations of veterinary offices and clinics. Uh, staff can then address these specific items through the conditional use permit to ensure that the proposed use is meeting these requirements. Uh, these limitations for a veterinary clinic include that all clinic activities are restricted to the medical care and treatment of small animals during regular office hours. The boarding and breeding of animals is prohibited. All activities um, must be completely contained within the enclosed building, and the clinic shall be designed to mitigate sound to surrounding suites. Uh, <clears throat> the applicant has identified how this clinic will comply with these requirements, and so the hours of operation will be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, they offer services to household pets, which ends up being primarily cats and dogs. Uh, all activities do occur within the subject suite, so there's no outdoor storage or dog runs. Uh, and then sound mitigation is gonna be achieved through double walls between the clinic and the adjacent tenants. You'll notice that the subject suite is at the end of the building, and so there's only one shared wall um, with a neighboring suite. And then all biohazardous waste um, will be removed in accordance with all applicable regulations. Uh, staff agrees that these measures do comply with all of the requirements that are placed on veterinary offices and clinics. Uh, per the zoning ordinance, um, all of the noticing requirements have been met. A uh, notice of application and a notice of hearing postcard were mailed to all property owners within a 600 foot radius and all registered HOAs within a one mile radius. A legal ad was published in the newspaper and the site was, was posted in accordance with city requirements. Uh, as of this date, the city has not received any correspondence in opposition or support of this item. So in summary, the proposed use of a veterinary clinic is conditionally permitted within the Lake Pleasant Pavilion's PAD, subject to the limitations on use outlined in section 21-505. And when operated in accordance with the recommended conditions of approval, this use is not expected to disrupt any of the other nearby uses. Uh, staff recommends approval of the applicant's request for a conditional use permit under case CU 19-13, subject to the attached conditions of approval in Exhibit 1 of your staff report. And I'm available if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gunderson, for your report. Uh, any commissioners have any questions of staff on this item? All right, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the applicant present tonight? Would you like to speak, sir? Um, probably not necessary. It, it, it's that report. Okay. All right. May I ask, are, are you in agreement with the stipulations and conditions outlined in the staff's report? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ernest, have you received any speaker request forms? Okay. All right. With that, then, I'm going to close the public hearing. Are there any further questions or comments from commissioners on this CUP case CU19-13 before I request a motion? All right, seeing none, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I recommend that we, or I move that we uh, approve case CU19-13 to city council subject to conditions of approval. Thank you, Commissioner Althoff. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to 
Proof case CU19-13, conditional use permit for Banfield Animal Hospital, subject to the conditions and stipulations outlined in staff report. Uh, commissioners, would you please vote? And it passes unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. All right, we're going to proceed to our first study session item tonight, uh, beginning with Mobile Food Vendor Text Amendment TA20-02. There will be a staff presentation and possible discussion regarding a city-initiated amendment to Section 21-202, 21 21-503, and 21-505 of the Zoning Ordinance regarding Mobile Food Vendor Text Amendment. This item is for discussion only. Once again, no action will be taken at this time. Uh, staff, would you please present your report? Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I'm back once before. Um, what I'd like to do is set the table a little bit for the next couple of items, if you will. <clears throat> so if you can recall back in November of 2019, uh, I presented a project update to commission and it was a preview of things to come, if you will, coming attractions, things that staff was working on as part of our work plan for the 2020 uh, coming year. This is a continuation of that dialogue for the next couple of items. The first one uh, that we'll be talking about this evening is a preview of a text amendment uh, that will be coming in the weeks to come for actual formal consideration and also accessory structures and the general plan amendments. But right now, what we would like to do for the next couple of items, and in particular starting with the food trucks, is to provide the thought process, if you will, the methodology as to what we've been working on behind the scenes in a multi-department uh, collaboration, if you will, uh, in concert with the city uh, council subcommittee. And in that kind of collective effort, what we've done is a couple of different things. And I'll, let me start with. The city of Peoria is going to be initiating a text amendment uh, with regard to mobile food vendors. And if you please excuse my vernacular, I'm probably going to go back and forth between mobile food vendors and food trucks, as we all know and love and call them. Uh, but it also is more than just mobile food trucks, as you, uh, mobile food vendors, as you can see. Uh, mobile food vendors encompass a variety of actual vendors, uh, anywhere from hot dog carts, ice cream trucks, to actual food trucks, and somewhere in between. So what are we doing? We're going to be looking at section 21-202 of the land use matrix and the limitation on uses. Why are we pursuing this? Well, we're looking to modernize the zoning ordinance to comply with state regulations, which I'm going to touch on briefly uh, here as well. But what we're doing when we're coming up with these regulations is we're balancing the needs of the residents with balancing the needs of the businesses because we do feel that these particular vendors have a niche and a place within the community. So how do we come up with regulations to best include them within the community? So as I noted, this is a collaborative effort. Um, pretty much three quarters of the team that you see at this dais right now has had some part in the discussion. What you don't see is all the other departments behind the scenes and the dialogue that has going on. So while I have kind of the um, presumptive pleasure to kind of go through the overview this evening, I do want to introduce Jennifer Faustino, who is also a part of the team working on the text amendment. We do have a senior planner that's not here tonight, but he is here in our uh, thoughts, and that would be Rick Williams, our senior planner. Cody Gleason, principal planner at the end, and Mr. Hawkes has all weighed in in terms of this very complex uh, topic. So let's get started on some of the details in the background, if you will. So the Food Truck Freedom Bill, otherwise known as HB 2371, what did it do? It establishes statewide food and health safety standards for mobile food operators. It actually created uniformity across the state. It provided very specific definitions that we are incorporating within our text with regard to what is a mobile food unit and mobile food vendor. And a mobile food unit is a licensed food establishment that is readily movable and dispenses food beverages for immediate service and consumption for any vehicle. The underlined part, which is readily movable and immediate service and consumption, 
has been a topic of conversation as we have prepared this, um, have prepared the code. In addition to uh, what we have is the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. They've developed a model ordinance to provide input to cities and towns um, with collaboration from the National Food Truck Association and other vendors. So they have proposed code that, that they've weighed in on this issue as well. So collectively, what the team has tried to do is establish and look at what other cities are doing, what the House bill tried to accomplish, and come up with codes and regulations that are appropriate for Peoria. So within the ARS section, I did want to point out a couple of things of what the city can do. We can look at operations within or in uh, 250 feet of a reg residential zoning district. We can prohibit food trucks, if you will, if the site has insufficient parking. So if they have surplus parking, food trucks could go in there. We could restrict the number of parking spaces used, duration, and vehicle size. So those are key elements that the city can do. What we cannot do and it specifically said, was require a special use, a special permit that's not required of similar businesses. We need to treat all mobile vendors the same across the board. We cannot require separation from restaurants and businesses beyond what would be required for fire building and safety codes. We cannot restrict the use of legal parking. Only we can do those restrictions if it has insufficient parking. And if that mobile food vendor has already received a fire inspection uh, from another city within the past 12 months, we would not be able to ask for another one. So th that's the difference between what the city can and what we can't do. The current Peoria regulations, just to kind of give you some background. If you were operating on a semi-regular basis, depending on your hours of operation, and the extent, you would typically be required to have a temporary use permit. And the regulations within the temporary use permit actually predate that House Bill 2371. So the regulations we currently have in the code did not anticipate and were not intended for mobile food trucks. And the reason why we say that is it's a maximum of 30 days. You can only have it three times a year. It's site dependent. Um, you have to be 200 feet away from residential structures, and you have hours of operation limitations in there. For those instances where the mobile food trucks want to operate on a more frequent basis, this would not allow them to do so. It would only allow them to do so in a very limited duration, max of 90 days. So that was one consideration. So when we were starting to write the code, a couple different things that we looked at um, we did benchmarking across the valley. To some degree, every city has regulations. Some have even modified those regulations since the House bill, but not a comprehensive set of regulations. You will see inconsistencies across the board. We've noted a couple on the screen for you in terms of what were some commonalities. So typically, you can have one of two things either a business license or a business license and another special permit. Primarily all the cities that we looked at will typically require a business license. Some of them do not, some of them require more. So again, not a lot of consistencies. What we did find is the one across the board, they are all considered accessory uses. They're not a, considered a primary use. Why is that important? they need to be tied to an existing business on site. They can't just stand alone out there on their own in a vacant field. There needs to be some sort of use that's associated with it. All of the codes do require owner authorization. And if you notice, only two out of the 10 valleys require state and county licensing um, or food truck inspections, if you will. In terms of hours of operation, or in other words, duration, only Gilbert and Phoenix currently have some limitations on the particular uh, hours. So our next step was to actually look at the model, 
ordinance that was proposed by Arizona League of Cities and Towns. So what they suggested was, in terms of licensing or permitting, it is appropriate to either ask for a business license or a business license and permit, depending on what the city would like to do. For private property, they were suggesting that the food trucks would not be on any particular site more than six hours in a 24-hour period of time. Or you could establish a 96-hour time limit with exceptions. Those particular items we have to look at and interact with our code enforcement uh, operations to see how difficult or how easy it would be to, if we got a complaint, how would easy they could go out and enforce those regulations. So that was one consideration that we looked at. They, uh, in a compliance with the House bill, said it's, le it's limited to legal parking. You cannot enforce or say you have an exclusive right to a certain parking space. If you have sufficient parking in the center and you have surplus, that food truck could pretty much go anywhere on site. One key item is it does require proof of permission from the owner in order to be on the site for operations. They also looked at it from an operational standpoint. Uh, so I'll just kind of quickly go through these. From a fire and safety, they said uh, they need to be consistent with the International Fire Code or what was passed by other cities and towns. They need to have a trash uh, receptacle on site um, for the customer's employees. Maintenance was a consideration uh, to keep the area clean of debris um, and transport the trash off the site. In terms of noise, they did suggest follow the city and town uh, regulations. No amplified music uh, should be permitted or could be restricted, if you would. And the location, these are primarily in commercial and res retail zoning. And they suggested you could have a separation of minimum 250 feet from a residential area. That would be consistent with what's in the House bill. The service, they did suggest it, um, you could, a city or town could say the serving window needed to be located away from the street, and that would be uh, for the patrons, if you will, of the food truck, so you could kind of angle where they're at rather than in blocking uh, sidewalks and other locations, and so, or visibility to the street as people are passing by. So that was one other thing that they suggested. So in terms of where we've been and where we're going, what I did indicate is this is a multi-departmental uh, effort. We have received direction uh, in terms uh, from the, the city council subcommittee. We had a couple of sessions with them. They provided their feedback on the draft code that was completed in February 2020. We continue to have ongoing dialogue with um, internal stakeholders. As you can see, there's an open house. It is, uh, the notice was actually released today. We are inviting the food truck industry to come to an open house to review the code. Uh, that will be March 16th, Ms. Jennifer? 18th, March 18th. And so we do have that on the city's website along with the draft code for review. We will be bringing this back forward for consideration, for your formal consideration, and we'll dive into the details of what's in that proposed code. Uh, right now, we're looking tentatively in April of 2020. Uh, after that, uh, based on your recommendation, we would be looking for uh, council consideration in roughly May of 2020. And so that's the extent of my presentation for this evening, and we're open for any questions that you may have. Uh, Commissioner Alsop, you have a question? Yeah, there was a, a line about the food trucks having to be 250 feet from residential areas. How are you defining residential areas? Is that the, like the boundary of a house or within a residentially zoned area? Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Alsop, we are looking to see, number one, if, um, that separ if we are including that separation within the code and to the extent of clarifying clearly what a residential zoning district would be. So part of what we will bring back to the table in front of you will be a very clear definition of where we're taking that measurement from. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Otluski, you have a question. Yeah, similar question along the residential line. So if a 
homeowner wanted to have a birthday party and bring in a taco truck or an ice cream truck to park for the party in a residential neighborhood in front of their home, how is that affected by the statement of a residential zoning district? Commissioner Aluski, that is a great question. Uh, it would not be applicable to this uh, code and requirement. The reason being, if you were having a private party on site uh, that can be handled through uh, a temporary use permit, if it's a sizable operation, um, or it's also a private residence, what the House bill in 2019 contemplated, but was not passed, was if you were operating on a private property and you were solely having the food truck for your own residence and you're not serving to the outside public, you would not be applicable to these regu regulations. And so that's how we would be treating it as well. Okay. And, and I guess just to follow up to that, that I saw a statement of no music or amplified music. I'm going to miss that ice cream truck going down the street with that wonderful song it always plays. <laughs> Commissioner Aluski, <laughs> while the uh, Model City did suggest that uh, no music uh, or amplified music, we are looking to see so long as the food trucks and the other vendors meet uh, the city noise ordinance, uh, you would be able to enjoy the ice cream truck music as it goes down the road. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> any, for, any further questions on this item from any commissioners? No. We just had a few, Ms. Deaver. Um, so... I'm not sure I'm quite clear on how closely our proposed ordinance that this council subcommittee is going to be putting forth, how closely that's going to resemble the city, uh, League of Cities and Towns model. Are we going to take some pieces from that? But I'm trying to get to, it seems like this house legislation was meant to address the inconsistencies from city to city for food truck vendors, which I totally get. Um, but yet we have a model ordinance, but it sounds like we're not going to follow that more that model ordinance either closely or maybe we are. I don't know. I'm trying to get my wrap my mind around that a little bit. Mr. Chairman, I will give you um, a, an A for trying to get out of me what you're going to see in the coming weeks and months. Um, so what I <laughs> and I'm not an attorney by trade. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is um, the model city ordinance, the model ordinance um, does have a lot of the components that we are looking at. You will see okay. a lot of consistency to what degree that will remain a mystery until we bring it back for formal consideration. Or I can invite you to go onto our website for a preview and download the draft right now that we will be talking with the food truck industry. Uh, in in the couple of weeks, so you can preview it oh, if I you can wish. Get it. It's on the website now. It for is all on the website. Well, oh, how about that? Um, so, Representative Payne um, Peoria mm -hmm. is one who put this forth. Um, my understanding is he had attempted to further loosen those regulations, and you alluded to his House Bill twenty six thirty six, and that's the one that would have made it legal for food vendors to park on private property. Um, it, it failed, as you mentioned, in the Senate. But I know there's been some interest in reviving an amended version of that, and just reading through some of the uh, documents online. Are we keeping an eye on that? Do we anticipate that, that an amended version of that particular legislation addressing the residential zoned presence of these food, that they will come back and that we'll have to further modify these um, the zoning ordinance? Mr. Chairman, great question. Uh, yes, the legislation is back in session. We actively monitor bills that are going before uh, both on the House and the Senate side as well that could alter or perhaps modify what we're intending to do. What we have done, um, as you've mentioned, the bill that failed last year uh, talking about food trucks on private re residences, we are trying to build a code to assume at some point that likely will move forward so that okay. provision would be accommodated in the current code that we would be looking to, to provide to you. If there are any other changes that we need to consider, we will closely monitor those and we then may pause uh, the text amendment to see what those w would be and in the likelihood that they may pass. If there's anything that we think is of merit, we will immediately make those changes and try to get those incorporated before we come before the board is, um, in, or the commission and city council. This is a moving dialogue. Mm -hmm. We, as we talk to the stakeholders, what we are going to do is provide um, a review of those comments and our response 
to them, whatever it may be, so that you also have that information within your packet as well. So while we know this is an ongoing dialogue, we're trying to closely monitor what we think that we're providing out to the public is sound right now. We've had a lot of departments weigh in. Um, we've had leadership weigh in. What we think we have um, is a good solid base to be working from. Okay, that answers my question, I appreciate it. Was that a pun moving discussion as we're talking about mobile, tr movie, uh, mobile food trucks? Because that was pretty good if that was intended. <laughs> no, it was an accident? All right. All right, uh, any further questions on this one from the commission before we move on to our next study session item? Thank you for your report, Ms. Deaver, and your work on this. Thank and you. to uh, everybody who's been involved with that, I know this is, uh, uh, has a lot of uh, intricacies to it, and, uh, and it's not as simple as it obviously first appears. There's a lot of things to consider. So I appreciate everybody's hard work on this one. And look forward to seeing the text amendments in April. All right, next we're going to talk about item 4R, study session on accessory structures. And bear with me as I find my place here, the agenda. All right, so we're going to be, uh, this study session regarding uh, accessory buildings, text amendment TA 20-01. Again, we're going to hear a staff presentation followed by a discussion only on the city initiative amendment to section 21-422, property development standards for permitted accessory buildings of the zoning ordinance to amend the property development standards for accessory buildings within residential zoning districts. Uh, again, this is items for discussion only, no action will be taken. Uh, please present your report. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners. I'm Amanda Beck. Uh, Senior Planner Jason Clughorn and I have been working on a text amendment to change those single family accessory building requirements outlined in the zoning ordinance. Um, this is something that I will be doing just a study session on tonight, so no action needed. Text Amendment TA20-01 is a city-initiated code change. Um, this came at the direction of the City Council Subcommittee on Codes, and it will be a change to the single-family residential sections 21-422 and 21-423. Uh, the subcommittee has asked city staff to simplify the height, size, and setback regulations that are currently in our ordinance. Uh, to inform this amendment, staff has started by doing some benchmarking research, so looking at the regulations that cities in um, the other parts of the valley have as far as accessory structures and buildings. Uh, additionally, we've been coordinating with our partner departments, including code enforcement, to work on how the new language should be crafted. Now for the brain teaser. Uh, all buildings are structures, but not all structures are buildings. Why is that important? When we say accessory buildings, what we are talking about is a roof structure that is subordinate and accessory to the primary dwelling on a parcel. Uh, generally, that means RV garages, ramadas, detached garages, sheds, pergolas. City planning staff interact with these sort of accessory buildings typically in one of two ways. Predominantly, the way we interact with them is when a property owner needs our guidance as far as what their uh, side or rear yard setback is, what their side requirements would be, um, and also if there are any considerations in regard to their neighbor. So what we have currently is a three-tiered regulation system uh, that looks at their yard, their size, placement, and then also if it's required to meet uh, the regulations in the design review manual. So uh, we help the property owners navigate how close they can be to their setback, depending on their size and their height, or how close they can be to their property line, depending on their size and their height, and depending on the tier that they fall into, if they are going to have to submit for a design review or possibly a design review waiver, and then also if they're going to be subject to a building permit. The other way that we interact with accessory buildings in the department is when a single family design review comes in and a developer is submitting standard plans. So the trends that staff have been seeing, a lot of developers are starting to now put in with their standard plans, detached accessory buildings such as RV garages um, or detached casitas or also RV garages that have livable options uh, like lofts above 
or also an attached casita with that RV garage. So uh, with tonight's presentation, I'd like to run through the average details regarding height and square footages for these types of buildings that we see, because these heights and square footages will really help us craft the language for the new text amendment. Uh, for RV garages, the typical height is between 20 and 25 feet, feet, and the square footage is usually at or above 1,200 square feet. Uh, with more high-end developers, we are starting to see those RV garages with livable options, such as the color elevations that you see on the screen. Detached garages come in um, very often from property owners who live in older subdivisions within the city. They are anywhere from 12 to 15 feet in height, and the square footage can vary pretty widely from 320 square feet to a toy garage, if you will, of up to 3,000 square feet. Uh, these buildings tend to be prefab, and city staff often have to work with the property owners because they are almost always metal, and the principal dwelling is almost always stucco. Uh, so we work with the property owner to either have them do a, de a full design review if it's a new build, and it's not prefab, uh, or a design review waiver, which they would then request a waiver from possibly roof type, color materials, architecture, or roof style. Uh, the trend with many of these accessory buildings is that they are built or installed after the principal dwelling. So think going to Home Depot to pick up a tool shed to store all your tools, uh, which can pose problems for property owners who don't understand our current regulations. I will admit they are a little bit tricky, especially with the if and or statements that are currently in there. Uh, typical shed heights range from 4 to 12 feet and the square footage will vary anywhere from 150 to 400 square feet. Uh, Tough Shed definitely has the market on that. I mean, you can get a small 150 square foot or you can get a she shed in your backyard that looks really awesome with clear story windows and you know nice architectural features. Uh, the problem with that is though, since they are mass produced and they're sold from Arizona to Vermont, the architecture, roof style, color, and materials don't always match with our vernacular here in the Southwest. So lastly, there are ramadas and pergolas. The height is anywhere between 10 and 15 feet, and they are anywhere from 150 to 400 square feet. Uh, depends really on the property owner's aesthetic or their budget. Um, they can complement the color materials and architecture of the house, or they can completely depart from it. Uh, similar to homes with optional RV garages, we're seeing trends with the developers coming in on their standard plan showing ramadas um, in adjacent to a pool, especially with their model home sites, to really emphasize a high-end outdoor living element. So what are our current regulations? As section 21-422 is currently written, regulations of an accessory building is based on height and size broken into three tiers. So if an accessory building is less than eight feet tall and is less than 200 square feet, it can be located within the side or rear setback. If the building is located, or if the building is between eight to nine feet tall or is greater than 200 square feet, it can be located three feet from the side or rear property line and must be screened from public view. If the building exceeds nine feet tall and or is 300 square feet, it must meet the principal dwelling's primary setbacks and also meet the requirements outlined in the design review manual. These three tiers do not neatly align with some of our other requirements, uh, such as requiring a building permit, which is when you hit 200 square feet, or complying with the design review manual, which is when you are at 300 square feet, regardless of your height. So obviously this can cause a lot of confusion when we have property owners who come into the planning counter. Staff is working to craft language that takes into account the many accessory, that many of these accessory structures come in after the principal home has been built. Um, but also the fact that a lot of the New developers that are putting in these detached accessory buildings uh, tend to have large accessory buildings, so that's something we need to keep in mind when we're crafting the language um, because we need to strike a balance between property owner rights but also possible impacts uh, to 
visual or nuisance effects on their neighbors. Um, also, this often comes to the city's attention through code enforcement. Um, a property owner might install something either without a building permit or that doesn't currently meet our regulations and uh, it comes into us and so we work with the property owner to help them go through either de the design review process or the waiver process to ensure that they comply with our regulations. Um, so when we are done drafting the language, we will keep in mind we're gonna be cognizant that whatever we put into the new text, that it is cognizant of how our code enforcement officers are going to then go out into the city and enforce the code. We also wanna make sure that it is user friendly for the property owners. Uh, we want it to be pretty straightforward, which is part of the reason why the subcommittee has asked us to simplify that three tiered system. Um, next steps for text amendment TA20-01 will include uh, working more with our partner departments. We've had some internal discussions uh, to craft where we're going with the draft text so far. Uh, and we'll continue to do that and keep them on the loop as we change things. And also just make sure that the final draft text that we propose doesn't conflict with their needs and is in alignment with all of the other city requirements in addition to the International Residential Building Code. Uh, prior to bringing the amendment before the commission for a final recommendation, we'll be working with the city attorney's office to make sure that the language looks good and is all finished. So we hope to bring this back in April, uh, but that is tentative based on our other departments, uh, particularly the city attorney's office, and then tentatively we would hope to go before the city council in May. So with that, I will take any questions that you have. Great, thank you for your report, Ms. Beck. Uh, do we have any questions on this from any of the commissioners? Mr. Fighter? I have one. W will there be any consideration, because I know on there's a lot of times when there's like a casita or a secondary structure, there's limitations on the kitchen uh, equipment that's, al that's allowed in there. Is that gonna be revisited in this scenario? Or have we thought about that? Commissioner Fighter, it's a good question. So what we're looking at doing with the first phase of this text amendment is to uh, reevaluate the height and the size uh, restrictions and the, some of the design items. We will likely be coming back for a phase two for a much larger discussion in terms of accessory dwelling units. At that particular time, we'll be kind of opening up and taking a more broad brush approach uh, to the code it, in itself and covering that particular item. All right, thank you. Um, I, I just had a question here, and I apologize if you mentioned it, I missed it, but we're just talking about detached structures, right? So this, this new trend with the super garages attached to houses that are these huge monstrous garages, they're lovely, but they're like, on a normal lot. Uh, are they captured in this? Will they be? Or is that a whole separate discussion altogether? Chairman Nelson, they would not be subject to these regulations. Okay. So when it is attached to the principal structure, it basically becomes a part of the principal structure. So it has to meet uh, setback height. Oh, it has to blend with the principal building in all ways. Okay. So although that's, okay. That makes total sense here. And uh, the only other question I had is, I didn't, again, if I missed, I apologize. But is there going to be a stakeholder meeting for this one? as well, like we were doing for the previous text amendment? Uh, we hadn't proposed one, um, but it's certainly something that we can do. Since it's citywide, it's a little bit hard to, besides putting up on the website and having <clears throat> a legal ad, it's a little bit hard to engage um, particular stakeholders. Okay. But it's certainly something we can look into if the planning commission How is How are we interested. capturing their feedback? And then I guess would be my, my follow up on that one. Yeah, and, and what, is, what does the commission think about that outreach program? We, we thought that because the constituencies are wide and broad, putting on the website, ask for comment, but we certainly could if the commission found that important. I personally like that when we can include, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's a representative body, you're in the construction industry, uh, Mr. Hutchison, so maybe you can speak to this, but uh, I am not, but I don't know if there's, uh, you know, some kind of an um, organization that represents, um, you know, builders of these types of structures that could, could be consulted or something like that. Um, I just uh, think that that's another voice that needs to be at the table.
to see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what kind of structure are they seeing? Are there some new developments in this area that maybe we're not aware of that are uh, starting to get requested by homeowners? There's a new trend that might uh, affect some of these ordinances. That's just my two cents worth, probably worth one cent. But uh, were you going to say something? No. <laughs> okay. It's going to be a joke. <laughs> it was a joke. Yeah. Jokes are welcome. All right. Commissioner Alsop, you have a, a question or a comment? Yeah, my primary concern is you know, I, I would be interested in making sure that the end result is it's, it's easier to do this properly for a homeowner. Um, I'm less concerned about the shed manufacturing business, uh, but I am in favor of enabling homeowners to be able to make those modifications in a streamlined process. It sounds like that's the goal. Um, and you addressed that the code was hard for some people to read. I understand a lot of people that have challenges with that, so making it easier is something I'd be in favor of. Commissioner Alsop, that is chief among the tasks from the subcommittee to make sure that it is more user-friendly. Uh, currently, we have a handout that staff has created that makes our current regulations more accessible. So hopefully we can do away with the handout. Um, we'll certainly evaluate when we're done with the text and the amendment is hopefully uh, approved if we need to keep it or not. But it should be easier and I think it'll better align so people don't also have to figure out, do I have to get a building permit? Um, how do I comply with the design review? Great, thank you. Yeah, again, great work. I'm glad to see this happening. Uh, any further questions before we move on to the next item? All right, seeing none, we're going to go on to, thank you for your report again, appreciate it, and thank you for your hard work on this. Item 5R, this is our third and final study session item tonight. It's in regard to 2020 general plan amendments. We're going to hear a staff report and have a discussion regarding processing of amendments to the general plan during the 2020 calendar year and the process of placing the plan Peoria AZ general plan on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. Staff, please present your report. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I am back before you. I can see we're nodding our head again as expected. Um, so what I would like to do this evening um, is to kind of walk you through the uh, general plan amendments coming forward to you. Also to give you um, some information to kind of help you out as we approach the November ballot for the 2020 um, election cycle. But first, Every general plan discussion we ever have, we typically run through the, the background for what is a general plan and why it is. Why is that important? Because our viewing folks out in the uh, proverbial social media audience, I always like to educate, I always like to inform, and the gentlemen this evening in, uh, in the audience are also expecting me to do a quick overview of what they would like you to see as well coming um, in, in the next couple of weeks. So let's get to the background. What is a general plan? It's a, sta a state mandated document. It's the vision of the city. Looks out uh, 10, 20 years and beyond. It's only good for 10 years. Uh, ARS basically tells us that you need to go back for voter ratification every 10 years. Last ratification that we had was in 2010. Well, that looked out to the horizon of 2020. We're into that future. We're now looking forward to 2040. We had before you, as you can, I know you can recall, in 2019, we had a comprehensive update that basically turned the document on its head, if you will. We came up with themes. We have new goals and policies. We're getting it ready to go uh, for voter ratification. That is fast approaching. But I would like to remind you that any amendment to a general plan can be one of two forms. It can be privately initiated or it can be city initiated. Also, there are two classifications for those amendments, either a minor amendment or a major amendment. And each city determines what uh, that criteria is and they process those applications accordingly. So why is that important? In the coming uh, months, we are going to be instituting a blackout period. Why? We successfully did this in 2001 and 2010 as we put the, the, excuse me, we put the general plan on the ballot. 
We did so because we're trying to avoid voter confusion. We're trying to keep the general plan intact as it goes to the voters. And as we approach when we're going to be asking the city council to put that on the date, we want to kind of stop processing amendments so what the voters hear and see about stays intact. We're minimizing voter confusion. So as I noted, the city council adopts a final draft that will be coming soon and they place it on the ballot that same night. That particular hearing is May 19th. We need that particular hearing because of election requirements. We have um, days, a number of days that we have to hit in certain order uh, for election requirements. So in order to make the November 3rd ballot, as of May 20th, we're cutting off processing or the city will not take any action on pending general plan cases. It won't mean that we're not processing things behind the scenes, but we will not be bringing those forward for action either to a Planning and Zoning Commission or City Councilor during that time. So what we're saying is that blackout period is between May 20th through November 3rd. Now we've had a number of general plan amendments and rezoning cases kind of in the pipeline. And so I wanna kind of take you um, back a little bit to the amendment cycle, if you will, as to what's gonna be moving forward and what won't be moving forward this year. If you remember, a major amendment can only be heard and considered once per calendar year. Our current uh, city council action is, is happening either in November or December. That actually coincides with the timing of the ballot issue. So the city or a private uh, initiated amendment that is considered a major amendment cannot be processed within the 2020 time given that period. So we are suspending all action on major general plan amendments. Minors, on the other hand, minor general plan amendments can be considered throughout the year. However, we, we the city will not be scheduling those during the blackout period. So that means if there's a case, a rezoning case that doesn't have a general plan amendment associated with it, the rezoning case can continue to move forward throughout the year. If there is a rezoning case that has a general plan amendment, it either needs to be heard in advance of when we take this and put this onto the ballot, or it has to completely wait until after November in order to be heard. So what does that mean? We have a total of four uh, minor general plan amendments that will be heard. We have two that are privately initiated that will have zoning cases attached to them at some point if those general plan uh, amendments are approved. But right now, those two private initiated amendments are asking to call in the land use question to see if those land uses are appropriate to have this move forward for council consideration. And I'll get in and kind of, I'll walk you through those briefly right now. We also have two city initiated um, amendments as well. But starting with the two privately initiated amendments, we have, uh, the first one is Arrowhead RV in boat storage. It is approximately 19.6 acres. Um, it would be a traditional residential designation, they are asking to move to an employment industrial land use designation. This is the former London nursery site. At this particular time, I'm not gonna do any formal uh, analysis, background information. They do have a rezoning case associated with it, but that portion is not ready. They're asking to call the land use question in advance uh, for consideration by Planning and Zoning Commission so that they, if they are successful, are incorporated into that final draft of the general plan that goes for council consideration in May and placed on the ballot. So what they're trying to do is get advanced and be placed on the ballot. The second, I'm seeing a question, Mr. Chairman, are you? Okay. Okay. And we'll, we'll get to them. Yep. 
So the second item um, for consideration is Peoria Commons. Uh, this particular site is approximately 10.7 uh, acres. It is south of the southwest corner of 91st and Olive Avenue, approximately on the Butler alignment. Uh, it is adjacent to the Loop 101. Uh, there's a multifamily complex to the south. There's some uh, commercial to the north. Uh, there's a residential on the eastern portion of it. They look to bring a rezoning case um, shortly if they are successful uh, with this particular application. So again, they're asking for the commission to look at the land use uh, application and make the call. We will have in both of these instances a zoning case back before you at some point down the road. We're just trying to get in advance of the cutout date for the blackout period. The next two that we've kind of talked about uh, in previewing of last year, we need to go in and uh, further refine the implementation uh, plan section in the uh, general plan. So chapter eight, we're gonna be adding actionable items that the city is already currently doing or will be doing shortly uh, within the next five to 10 years timeframe. We're going to be including those in the document. The last item that we're going to be presenting to you is a slight update to the land use map. We have continued the dialogue with our stakeholders, including state land and some private uh, stakeholders as well. Those um, conversations continued past the 2019. Now we're looking at making some of those changes um, in advance, placing those uh, on the draft that goes in front of uh, city council in May. So we're trying to encapsulate the last chance that we've uh, worked with our stakeholders, captured those comments, and we're trying to make those changes to the land use map so that we have um, a clean map going forward. There are approximately four to five of those small changes um, that we've worked with on stakeholders. Uh, if you can recall, one of them was because of the realignment of the Gem Wax Road uh, next to the Bard Ranch property. That was a late uh, kind of shift because our engineering department finally, uh, the consultant working for them came up with a slightly different alignment. What we have for land uses doesn't make sense anymore because of the shift in the roadway. So they've agreed and suggested we make a change. And so you'll see that is one of the items. So in terms of next steps, so I've kind of talked briefly about it, but March 19th, all four of these minor GPAs will be formally presented to commission for consideration. We will be doing an in-depth analysis on all of these and presenting information. Uh, this is an actual new test, if you will, of the goals and policies within the 2040 plan adopted in 2019. So you will see a fairly lengthy land use, true high level discussion of land use on the March 19th meeting. So those meetings, uh, so those items would then go forward for uh, council consideration April 21st uh, for formal action. If they are successful, staff quickly then has to get those changes, make the changes to the land use map, reincorporate those and ready to go back in front of city council for adoption on May 19th. So that's why we have um, some separation between the amendments and when we take the final draft, if you will. So again, uh, blackout period, May 20th through November 3rd. Uh, no general plan amendments will be brought before you during this time frame. You will see zoning cases if they do not have an accompanying general plan with them, an, an, amendment, an amendment with them. Hopefully I did not confuse you too much on that particular one. And so I'm going to open it up for whatever questions you may have. Thank you for that report. Any questions from commissioners? Okay, the confused guy right here. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. So it sounds like if we've got a case where there's a GPA and a rezone, we're going to break them apart, do the GPA before May 19th. We'll take that on and consider that separately. If there's a rezone attached to it, that'll be taken care of later in the year, possibly during the blackout period over the summer, what may be. So there could be cases you're literally breaking in half and doing the GPA separate from the rezone. Mr. Chairman, you have it correct. So, okay. so March 19th, you're gonna see the GPAs. If they are successful, gotcha. they move forward and adopted April 21st. Once those GP categories become effective, if you will, yeah. the rezoning cases will proceed in, in advance 
at that Perfect. point in time when they are ready to go. Thank you for that. All right, appreciate it. All right, uh, last call, any questions? All right, thank you for that report. Good stuff. All right, that, that concludes our study session items tonight. We're gonna next do our call to the public. Are there any comments from the public on non-agenda items tonight? Going once, twice. All right, seeing none, we're gonna move on to our next item. And that is updates from staff. Does staff have anything further to report tonight? Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, no further report other than to, to point out the next meetings that we have. The March 19, of course, the one Lori just mentioned, and then April 2nd, we have some items too. That's it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay, any uh, reports and updates from the Planning and Zoning Commission? Uh, Commissioner Altluski. Yeah, it was just, uh, I wanted to make a comment, and I'm sorry, I forgot her name. But she's an engineer here at Pe the city of Peoria, and she was at the Westmark's um, connectivity forum that I attended. I'm on the on the um, one of the committees there, and they presented Smart City uh, with a, a group. There's three people that, including Verizon, came in and talked to us about what it means to build a smart city, and it was interesting to talk to her after the meeting because it sounds like Peoria is very involved and one of the cities that's cooperating throughout the valley that continue to bring this forward. And my thought of what a smart city was was close, but the vision of what a smart city will be in the future is like so different. Um, but I just wanted to say it was good to see that Peoria was represented there. Uh, she was very engaged and uh, it was, I was proud to to be from Peoria also. Great, thank you for that. All right, any other questions? I mean, sorry, uh, any uh, updates from commissioners? No party update? Uh, I, I just want to extend my appreciation to the city for the wonderful uh, appreciation event last Friday. It was just wonderful, the music was great, the food was wonderful, the venue, a different venue than we've been to in the past, at least that I've been part of, great venue. Uh, so thank you for that, for that wonderful appreciation dinner. We felt appreciated, didn't we? All right. I had no further uh, comments. Uh, seeing no further business, I'm going to call this meeting adjourned.